The Appropriations uh, Subcommittee on Labor, Health, Human Services, Education, and other related agencies uh, will come to order. Uh, started a few minutes late. The good news is I'll submit part of my opening statement for the record as a result of uh, part of the delay being on, on me. Uh, glad we're here. Uh, this is our first budget hearing of this year. Thank you, Secretary DeVos, for appearing before the subcommittee again today to discuss the department's FY 2020 budget request and help us uh, kick off uh, our process for uh, this year. Last year, we passed the Labor HHS bill prior to the start of the fiscal year for the first time in 22 years. The conference agreement received 93 votes on the Senate floor. It's a pattern uh, that I'd like to see develop. Of course, you don't have a pattern until year two. Uh, and so being sure, being able to do this again one more time uh, would make a big difference. Uh, I hope we uh, begin a trend that uh, starts today. Uh, last year, we got 75% of the government funded before the beginning of the fiscal year. Uh, the lesson of the shutdown should be that we should do figure out what we did for 75% of the government and figure out how to get it done for 100% of the government. I would say the big obstacle we face in getting that done is having a number we can work with. Uh, and I want to go back to that as I talk about the budget that you've submitted. Um, the um, importance of having a number and having it early really matters. We had that last year. Many of us on this committee advocated that that um, number that we would actually be able to use would be available maybe as part of the uh, of the uh, beginning of the fiscal year for uh, those agencies that weren't funded last year. I was disappointed that that didn't happen, uh, but it didn't. Uh, the FY 2020 budget request for the department is $64 billion in discretionary funding. Uh, that's ten. That's almost 10 percent less than the amount last year. Now the request, frankly, is similar to last year's request in many respects. Like like last year, it eliminates or consolidates approximately 30 programs. Uh, it significantly reduces funding for several others. All of the programs sponsored for elimination or significant reductions were proposed to be eliminated last year too. I appreciate the decisions you have to make. And just as uh, uh, we approach this budget, we need to do that remembering that while we are unlikely, uh, when we finally appropriate to be bound by the Budget Control Act, uh, it is the law. And the administration doesn't have quite the flexibility to wait for uh, time to catch up with the law that we do. Discretionary spending under the Budget Control Act would reduce by, uh, for non-defense, would reduce by 9 percent this year. To remind my friends on the committee that President Trump did not sign the Budget Control Act, President Obama did. Secretary DeVos did not vote for the Budget Control Act. Almost every one of us who were here when we passed it did. Uh, and that's the law. It, it's a law that uh, for the last couple of times at least we have figured out uh, that it didn't seem to make sense in the current circumstances, but it's the law as it was put together, and it is still the law. We wouldn't be having this hearing in exactly the same way if we would have come up with what I believe would have been more realistic numbers, both for defense and non-defense, uh, as part of ending last year's work. But we didn't get that done, and I hope we do get that done uh, quickly. The President's budget proposes to reduce non-defense discretionary uh, by $55 billion. That's almost exactly the reduction required by the law. The 9 percent that the law would require the president to uh, use as his top number is the number that uh, the president's budget is submitted. Um, I agree that we really have to constantly evaluate programs uh, and be willing to reduce or eliminate funding for programs that are ineffective and prioritize that funding elsewhere. In fact, uh, Senator Murray and I and others on this committee did this, particularly the first two years we worked together when there was no new money, but we set some significant new priorities. And by doing, doing that, I think we either eliminated or combined 32 different programs. 
Uh, so we have capacity to do that, and we should have the capacity uh, to hear you out and look at the programs that you think we need to look at uh, more carefully. There are programs here uh, that uh, are unlikely to be eliminated in any, any final budget, and I'm sure they'll be vigorously discussed. But I would remind my colleagues the one reason we have had for three years now, and for the first three years in well over a decade, a bipartisan committee report out of this committee is that we have worked hard not to make things we agree on more partisan than they need to be. Um, this budget is that mu not that much different from the budget the president submitted last year. My guess is that the work of this committee will not be that much different from the work of this committee last year. Uh, the work of this committee, what we did last year, and we'll see how this goes. So we're going to have this hearing today. Uh, Secretary, appreciate your uh, willingness to take this job, the hard uh, work that you have put into this job, uh, and I'm sure there'll be a number of questions about uh, the budget you've submitted, and I'd like to turn to Senator Murray uh, for her opening remarks. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, over the past two years, you and I have been able to pass bipartisan spending bills that do invest in our children, our students, our workers, our patients, uh, women, families, and that was only possible because we did work together and found common ground and rejected the administration's harmful budget request, including proposals to get funding for students, teachers, and public schools, and requests for Secretary DeVos's privatization agenda. I'm very pleased we were able to work together and pass the most recent appropriations bill from this uh, subcommittee before the start of the fiscal year. Unfortunately, as we all know, President Trump decided to hold half of our spending hostage and shut down the government earlier this year. And that temper tantrum over a wall that Mexico was supposed to pay for actually cost our, con our economy $3 billion, and it forced 800,000 federal workers to go without paychecks for over a month. In my home state of Washington, thousands of workers at SeaTac Airport and across the state were forced to work without pay, take out loans, forced to figure out how to make ends meet, all because of this manufactured crisis. So I hope we can avoid that spectacle this year in this appropriations process and keep the government funded. Um, in addition to rejecting Trump's harmful budget proposals, we, we do have to reach a deal to lift the sequester caps and restore critical investments in defense and middle class prior priorities. I was very proud to be able to reach a deal with then Speaker Ryan in 2013 to do exactly that, that, lift the sequester caps and restore critical investments. And I'm really glad we've been able to build on that deal since then. Um, so Secretary DeVos, with that in mind, I do want to discuss your budget proposal in front of us today. Um, and I always say a budget is a reflection of your values. And given that your budget request fails to invest in our youngest learners, our students in public schools, it fails to help students who are struggling to better themselves in um, higher education, and it fails the student loan borrowers who are saddled with debt, it sort of speaks volumes about where your priorities lay and who you are fighting for as the Secretary of Education. It is also telling that at the same time as you sit before us requesting these devastating cuts to public education, the President's budget proposal is still pushing for your privatization agenda, which neither the public wants nor Congress has authorized. Now, I do want to dig into some of your requested cuts today because I believe it is important to fully understand your vision for the future of education in our country. Your budget request cuts more than $4 billion from after-school programs and other needed investments in public school students, including completely eliminating federal support for the program that supports our nation's teachers and requesting no additional funding for low-income students, students with disabilities, at a time when many of our schools are struggling to meet the needs of those students. Additionally, I am disappointed that the budget zeroes out funding for Special Olympics education programs. You said this is about tough choices, but you're also asking at the same time for more money for charter schools when you are having trouble spending the increase Congress appropriated for that last year. So this is not about tough choices. This is about you prioritizing your agenda over students with special needs. 
You've also once again failed to take any steps to make our schools and neighborhoods safer by addressing common sense gun safety measures or reducing the number of guns in our schools. This budget proposes cutting funding to colleges and universities too um, that primarily enroll low income students, students of color, including minority serving institutions. And it proposes to take more than $200 billion from the pockets of student loan borrowers by making them pay back more making some payback longer, and eliminating debt forgiveness for our public servants. These divisive proposals would not only harm students and families, but they are in stark, stark contrast with the efforts that Chairman Alexander and I, along with our colleagues in the House, are making to find common ground today and reauthorize the Higher Education Act. So, Secretary DeVos, I do have many questions about your budget proposals and other issues at the Department. But I do also want to take a minute to address the epidemic of sexual assault on our nation's college campuses and your department's proposed Title IX rule. Over the past year, I have spent a lot of time with brave women who have shared their experiences with me of being sexually assaulted on a college campus. It wasn't easy for them to share their deeply painful and traumatic story, but they did so because they wanted to help ensure it never happened to anybody else. I am very much in awe of these brave women and men who have publicly shared one of the worst moments of their life, and I'm standing with them and will continue to fight the end of epidemic sexual assault on our nation's college campuses. So I was extremely disappointed and concerned when you proposed a Title IX rule that would weaken those protections for survivors and allow colleges to actually shirk their responsibility to investigate claims of sexual assault and keep our students safe. I believe that if your rule goes into effect, campus sexual assault will once again be swept under the rug because students will not feel comfortable com coming forward knowing their school is less likely to act when they have been assaulted. So I genuinely hope that you take the time to read some of the 100,000 comments students and survivors submitted on that rule. And I hope you listen to their stories, listen to, uh, listen to these students, and start over on a rule that actually ensures schools are doing everything they can to keep students safe and give students a fair process that does not force them to be re-traumatized after they have reported an assault. And finally, I want to note how concerned I am about the department's responsiveness to this committee's direction. Your department has slow walked the hiring of staff at the Office of Civil Rights, despite explicit direction from this committee. You have ignored committee report language directing the department to protect student loan borrowers from unfair, deceptive practices of student loan companies. The department has dismissed a committee directive for a new competition for an open textbook pilot program designed to help our college students better afford higher education. And you have ignored committee directives to provide relief to student loan borrowers who were cheated and defrauded by predatory for-profit college, which now stands at 140,000 claims and counting. What surprised me about um, this inaction is that during last year's hearing, Chairman Blunt reminded you of the importance of being responsive to our committee. Additionally, you have not responded to a number of requests for information from me about critical aspects of department policy and administration, and I know several of Chairman Scott and Chair DeLauro's letters are also unanswered. It is unacceptable and unconstitutional to ignore Congress's oversight responsibilities and authority, so I expect answers to those letters as quickly as possible. And I hope in addition to answers to all of our questions today, we get a commitment from you to respond to those letters in a timely manner and be responsive to this committee's direction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Murray. Um, Secretary, Welcome again um, today, and we'll look forward to your opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman Blunt. Chairman Blunt, Ranking Member Murray, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the President's fiscal year 2020 budget. I thought it would be useful to begin by recalling Congress's commitment when it created the U.S. Department of Education 40 years ago. Then, Congress vowed that the move would, quote, not increase the authority of the federal government over education or diminish the responsibility for education, which is reserved to the states, and I'll add communities and parents. This budget reflects a commitment to that sentiment. 
It also recognizes who actually funds the government's budget, American taxpayers. And so we propose Congress spend their money wisely, efficiently, and with restraint. The President's fiscal year 2020 budget would reduce overall funding for department programs by $7.1 billion, which is a 10% de decrease from 2019's appropriated level. The budget eliminates, streamlines, or reduces funding for many programs that are duplicative, are ineffective, or are nonprofit organizations already appropriately supported by states, communities, or private philanthropy. Our proposed reduction is similar to last year's request and the year before that as well. I acknowledge that you rejected those recommendations. I also acknowledge that it's easier to keep spending, to keep saying yes, to keep saddling tomorrow's generations with today's growing debt. But as it's been said, the government will run out of other people's money. Over the past 40 years, federal taxpayer spending on education has increased about 180 percent, amounting to over $1.2 trillion cumulatively. And yet we're still 24th in reading, 25th in science, and 40th in math when compared to the rest of the world. Doing the same thing, and more of it, won't bring about new results. I propose a different approach, freedom. This budget focuses on freedom for teachers, freedom for parents, and freedom for all students. A great education shouldn't be determined by where you live nor by who you know. It shouldn't be determined by family income. And education shouldn't be an old school, one size fits all approach. Every student is unique and everyone learns differently. Every child should be free to learn where and how it works for them where and how it unlocks their potential. That's why the President's 2020 budget proposes a, a historic investment in America's students, education freedom scholarships. Our bold proposal will offer a dollar-for-dollar -dollar federal income tax credit for voluntary contributions to 501c3 nonprofit organizations that provide scholarships to school students, not school buildings. These students, their families, teachers, schools, states, all can choose to participate in the program, or they can elect not to participate. It's a choice. And since the proposal relies entirely on voluntary contributions to nonprofit organizations, it won't take a single dollar from local public school teachers or public school students. Indeed, our budget maintains current level funding, levels of funding for Title I and IDEA. And something else, education freedom scholarships aren't only for students who want to attend private schools. In fact, some states may choose to design, design scholarships for public school options, such as apprenticeships or transportation to a different public school. States have the opportunity to be really imaginative and to serve the unique needs of their students. We don't have to look far to see that education freedom works. Thanks to a menu of options and the DC Opportunity Scholarship Program, embraced by teachers, parents, and students alike, more than half of students in the district attend schools other than their assigned one, and there is still significant unmet demand. We propose Congress double the DC program's funding to $30 million to meet those students' needs. This administration believes students of all ages should be free to pursue multiple pathways to higher education and successful careers. That's why this budget proposes to expand the use of Pell Grants for quality short-term programs. It also invests in career and technical education and stream, streamlines student loan repayment. The latter is urgently necessary because today federal student aid holds $1.5 trillion in outstanding loans, more than total auto debt and credit card debt. And 43% of those student loans are either in default, more than 30 days delinquent, or are negatively amortized. And taxpayers are on the hook for it all. This budget consolidates numerous repayment plans and raises the cap on a borrower's monthly payment to 12.5% of discretionary income. This is one way the federal government can become a more responsible lender. Policy should not entice students into greater debt, nor should they put taxpayer dollars at greater risk. Education freedom isn't just for parents and students. Teachers need greater freedom as well. We seek to empower America's teachers and elevate their profession via this budget with a new total investment of $370 million. I regularly meet with a number of excellent teachers who tell me they'd like to choose their own professional development and customize it for their needs. 
To that end, the budget requests an increase of $170 million to focus on development that is controlled by teachers, not dictated by the district office. These teacher vouchers treat teachers as the professionals they are. Teachers also tell me about the value of mentors or residency opportunities. So we're requesting $200 million to enable new teachers more opportunities to learn from the best. It's also essential that teachers and students be safe at school. In the wake of tragic acts of school violence in our country, President Trump asked me to lead a federal commission on school safety. To support the commission's recommendations, we request $200 million to help communities develop their own school emergency plans and to focus on counseling and healthy behaviors for their students. In the end, budgets are about priorities. Ours are students, parents, teachers, and taxpayers. If our country is to remain secure, strong, prosperous, and free, we need students of all ages who are prepared to pursue successful careers and lead meaningful lives. Thank you for this opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, Secretary. Let's talk um, a little about workforce training first. I, you know, clearly this is a, at this moment in most places around the country, a very highly employed workforce uh, in terms of percentage of workforce. I think in our state, uh, my state of Missouri, the number is 3.2. Uh, uh, the mayor of Springfield, my hometown, was in the other day. He said the number there is 2% unemployed. Uh, people are at work, and uh, in uh, more and more of the recent trips I'm taking, people are talking about the people they've gone ahead and hired but who really aren't ready yet for the jobs they already have. And uh, a new term I hadn't heard before used two or three times was incumbent training, mm -hmm. you know, training the incumbent workforce they already have. Uh, but constantly the idea comes up of what we can do to give people more information and better choices earlier. You know, all of our funding programs have very much focused on traditional higher education, two-year, four-year college degrees. Uh, what uh, can we do to make it more possible for people to get into 15-week into certifiable programs? Uh, is there some way we can restructure the Pell Grants so that some of them could be used? And if we did that, who would be the, the more logical gatekeeper in, in that kind of world? Mm -hmm. Senator, uh, great, uh, great questions, and this is an issue for all of us to um, grapple with and to find ways to help uh, individuals really um, move on to their their next opportunities. We know that uh, that there are over seven million jobs going unfilled today, and uh, one of the proposals the budget makes is around short-term Pell grants to allow for high-quality certification or certificate programs to um, access, and uh, that's part of the proposal. Another part, I think, is, is really wrapped into this notion of education freedom that uh, we believe should expand from uh, the youngest of ages through lifelong learning. And uh, the, the proposal we have to create a federal tax credit that states could then opt to take uh, and use within their state to create programs to meet their own unique needs could allow for uh, e expansion of apprenticeship programs in, in high school, starting in high school, uh, expansion of dual enrollment programs. I, I happen to agree with you that students need to learn much earlier on what some of their options are and their opportunities for, for advancement. And, and so these are just a couple of the ways that states could address these things with, uh, with a new and creative approach. Yeah, in terms of earlier on, Secretary Acosta, in, in terms of earlier on, Secretary Acosta and I went to uh, the Carpenters Union training facility in St. Louis, and uh, they were talking about the lost decade that most people in that program have, that 10 years after they get out of high school, they're sort of searching for something to do and usually do that in uh, very low-skill, low-compensated jobs and, and then back in a program. Another thing, by the way, uh, we learned at that program that we've been working on in our state uh, is... Uh, what does it take to walk at the same time with a trade union certificate and an associate's degree? Uh, and the answer at that program was 15 hours. And all of our all of our potential journeymen know that from day one, what those 15 hours need to look like 
and how over the two or three years of this program, while they're working, they can get it. But uh, the other kinds of apprenticeship programs that aren't necessarily the trade union programs, uh, how, how do we certify whether they qualify for a 15-week certificate or the, the access to Pell Grants that you mentioned in this report? Well, I think these are very important questions, and we would look forward to working with Congress to put the appropriate guardrails around uh, uh, such a program and uh, suggest that this is a really important time for employers, for business and industry to be working closely with educators to help create those programs. The Swiss model actually has a, a lot to be learned and gained, and I, I, I would recommend that we look more closely at how they approach apprenticeships. Three quarters, almost three quarters of high school students are in an earn and learn situation, and it's in a wide variety of, of paths, of avenues, and, uh, and, and, and I think those are great opportunities for us to really look at and embrace, but would look forward to working with you. All right, very good. Let me ask one more question. You've mentioned now, again, the Education Freedom Scholarships. You're not asking for anything in this appropriation for that. That's a Finance Committee, ta it's, that's it's purely part a, of the, tr the Department of Treasury. Not that uh, our budget. members shouldn't have questions about it, but there's nothing we're asking for here. Doesn't create a new program, just to creates a new opportunity. And the funding would come through, From a, individual, through a tax yeah. committee decision. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, thank you. Senator Murray. Secretary DeVos, Secretary DeVos since you assumed office, Federal student loan borrowers who've been cheated by their colleges and overwhelmingly by predatory for-profit colleges have been blocked from getting the relief that they do deserve. You tried to reduce the amount of debt relief students can receive and you unsuccessfully tried to block new rules put in place by the Obama administration to streamline the borrow defense process and put in additional protections for our students. And according to the information that you provided to this committee, roughly 140,000 borrower defense claims are pending review by your department. And this number seems to increase by hundreds every day. When was the last time the department approved a borrower defense claim? Senator, thanks for your question, but uh, before I, I'll be happy to answer that, but before I do, I just want to address one thing that uh, you said in your opening statement, because I want to ensure um, you, you attacked and, and questioned my personal motives and my priorities, and I just want to be clear where my heart is. My heart is with all students, and uh, for their futures, I want every single student to have opportunity. I, I appreciate that. I only have and three and a half minutes. Left, I understand. So if you could I just my wanted question, to. I wanted to address that I because I appreciate I let that. that stand. Can you answer the question? When was the last time the, the department approved a borrower defense claim? Uh, the department is is reviewing and approving the ones for closed loan discharge regularly. As you know, the borrower well, defense rule, the the uh, judge has requested that that be put into effect. We are in the right. process of doing so. So has any, uh, let me just any, remind you that when I came into office, we were greeted with tens of thousands of claims correct. for uh, for borrower defense. And we did not agree with the Obama administration's approach to this. I, I That's understand why that, we but have a court order has to, now told you to move And we are in the process just, of my implementing question is, that. My question is simple. Um, has the department approved even one borrower defense claim since that court order? Uh, I believe so. Uh, we're, do, we're reviewing you, them regularly. How many? And I don't have the specific number. I'd be happy if you'd like many? to submit a question for yeah, the record. No, I'd like I'll to be know happy if any of your back. staff members behind you have an idea of when that, uh, how many have been approved? Well, okay. Apparently not. <laughs> um, there's nothing stopping you from providing full relief to struggling borrowers today. Uh, surely there must be some of those borrowers who you feel deserve, deserve a full discharge. And I don't understand why the department can't fully discharge the loan today for tens of thousands who were defrauded years ago by Corinthian colleges, including more than 2,000 from my home state who are waiting. The Corinthian college uh, students' uh, claims are being processed and dealt with 
forthwith and will continue to be. And we are continuing to review the appropriate steps based on the judge's request that this 2016 regulation be implemented, while at the same time we are continuing to work on that was revising six, that regulation. That was six months ago, and those students mm -hmm. are still waiting, that the court ordered this to move forward. So these students are waiting. And uh, and I want to know if you can get back to me how many have been approved because be happy, it appears to me that to we so. have not moved forward at all on this and that's not fair to those students or their families or their future. Um, let me move on. Um, earlier this year, your department attempted to replace the acting inspector general with a department employee after your de deputy secretary inappropriately and perhaps illegally requested that the OIG, quote, reconsider any plan that it might have to review the department's 2018 decision and 2018 recommendation, unquote, to re-recognize the accrediting council for independent colleges and schools. This so-called accrediting agency looked the other way while students were being cheated and being defrauded by predatory for-profit colleges, including that now defunct Corinthian College, ITT Technical Institutes, and Education Corporation of American Colleges. A number of my colleagues in the House and the Senate have asked for inf information multiple times to understand what exactly happened, and the response that we have received so far from the department has really been inadequate. Uh, will you commit to us to provide substantive answers to our questions on this. Senator, I'll be happy to, if you can clarify what exactly you're asking. Are you asking regarding the IG or ACICS? Well, I've been, we've been very clear on both, and we have that written into you. We got back a very inadequate response, mostly blanked out, um, and we deserve to have an answer on this. And Mr. Chairman, uh, th this whole episode uh, really leaves me concerned about the independence and Obje objectivity of the Department of Education's acting inspector general. I, I think we have to act to really establish the same kind of protections for this department's OAG that several ever, other subcommittees have done to provide their inspector generals um, the ability to be independent and objective, and I would like to work with you on that. I'm glad to work with you further on that, and uh, thank you for... Mr. Chairman, could, could I just respond to the um, IG... Issue yes. just a moment before we move on. Um, I, I want to clarify the fact that it, when our inspector general retired, a process was put into place to name an acting inspector general, Phil Rosenfeld, a 48-year employee of the education department who is his integrity and capabilities are unassailable and impeccable. That process was begun in October when um, a, a acting the, when the, the acting was named, it was later changed, and the uh, acting that assumed the role after uh, Kathy retired was put back into place, and we consider the matter closed. But to suggest that anything nefarious was was unfolding there well, is absolutely wrong and that, I want to go very clearly on the record. If you would do, on, well put that all in writing to us because you didn't do that but I will say that you completely left out the part here where the a deputy secretary inappropriately and again perhaps illegally requested that they reconsider uh, a plan that they have to do because of their independence. So I think there are numerous questions about this. If you will respond to us as we requested in writing fully, then we can have a conversation about whether it was appropriate or not. But I, meanwhile, again, Mr. Chairman, think it's impor important for us to preserve the integrity and independence of a, a, an attorney general at this department as other departments have. Seems reasonable that we could get that response within the same time of the window for the other questions that will come in writing, and we'll consider that a question for the record, and I'll be glad to follow up with you on this. Senator Alexander. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Madam Secretary. Mr. Chairman, I want to go back to your earlier comments, and it's not a subject for education, but it's an important subject for this subcommittee. I want to uh, thank you and Senator Murray, Senator Durbin, other members of the subcommittee for your leadership in setting priorities over the last three years on the National Institutes of Health. Uh, it's, it's, you've made significant increases in medical life-saving research, and you've done that the hard way by setting priorities, and that's real legislative leadership, and I thank you both for that. Second, 
I agree with you about needing a number. Uh, I think both Democrats and Republicans uh, would like for us to have a number to which we could begin to measure our appropriations, and the sooner the better, and I, I, I hope that will happen. Uh, Madam Secretary, I want to just mention a couple of things before I ask you a question. One, I, I appreciated the President's executive order about uh, colleges having skin in the game when it comes to loaning money to students to go to college. Uh, uh, Senator Murray and I, as she said, are working together to try to reauthorize the Higher Education Act. We hope to do that in the next few months, have something before our committee, and accountability and colleges having more participation in a sort of skin in the game is an important part of that discussion, and the administration's position, in my view, is helpful. Second, I want to thank you for putting the FAFSA on a mobile device. Um, 20 million families fill out the federal application form for Pell Grants and student loans every year. It's 108 questions long. Again, Senator Murray and I are working to simplify that. Uh, we co-sponsored legislation to take 22 questions off the FAFSA and keep um, families from having to give the same information twice to the government by allowing them to just one click import from the Treasury Department the information they've already given to the application for student aid. You've supported that. And you've made it easier for students to fill this out. I watched the students in Sevier County, Tennessee, work through even the 108 questions a lot more rapidly than I would have thought. So that's a big help. Um, the, the other thing I, I wanted to say is I want to commend you for your support for charter schools. And I keep wondering what, what the opposition to charter schools is. When they were invented by the Democratic Farmer Labor Party in Minnesota, 12 of them, in the early 90s. They've grown to 7,000. Their goal is to give, they're all public schools. The goal is to give teachers more freedom and children more freedom. They've been supported by every education secretary we've had since then and by every president, including President Obama, President Clinton, and the last Democratic Secretary of Education was an operator of charter schools. So I admire your support for charter schools. If you've got some extra money in one account, I'd like for it to be put in another account so we can encourage giving teachers more freedom and students more choices uh, of public schools. Now, here's one thing you've got that's new, and I've just got a minute and a half left, but I'm intrigued by your idea of giving stipends to teachers. Uh, I always thought, I know Secretary Duncan, President Obama's secretary, expressed this thought. Senator Harkin said the same thing that the Title II funding was probably the worst spent money in the education, federal education program. It's supposed to be for pr professional development, but it's split up between reducing class size by most states and check the box uh, programs that most teachers don't find useful. Your proposal, as I understand it, mm -hmm. is to begin a demonstration project to give teachers actually stipends so they could spend it at programs that they choose. I think back of the Governor's School for Teachers of Writing that we had at the University of Tennessee when I was governor. Teachers loved it. They went for two weeks, learned about writing, went back reinvigorated to their schools. It only cost a few hundred dollars each. Uh, Purdue University offers STEM programs. There are many programs across the country that could be accredited. What is your thinking about stipends for teachers to use their development money to choose their own professional development? Well, thanks, Senator, for uh, that question. It, it is part of our budget proposal to really empower teachers directly to um, advance their own careers, to develop themselves through a teacher voucher. And uh, it, the, the concept is such that uh, teachers would, we, we would have a pilot program to and uh, demonstrate through the program the effectiveness of giving teachers the empowerment over development dollars for them. So early stage career teachers may uh, choose one type of training. A mid-career teacher may choose something around uh, uh, you know, developing their uh, own subject area or matter further. And then later stage career teachers may be involved with learning how to uh, become mentors and uh, uh, guides for the newer teachers. Vi very wide range of opportunities and possibilities, and the thought is to have a pilot targeted program to test this out, but with meaningful funds behind it to give teachers the opportunity to make some meaningful decisions for their own development. 
Thank you very much, Mr. And Ms. Madam, uh, Madam Secretary, I think if you'd called a stipend instead of a voucher, you'd have fewer heart attacks on the other side of the aisle. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Alexander. Uh, Senator Durbin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, there's been some press reports of, about your testimony yesterday related to the Special Olympics, and I hope we can get that clarified here. Did you personally approve the elimination of the $18 million from your budget to help the Special Olympics? Well, Senator, as you know, uh, budget process within the administration is a collaborative one, and uh, it's been my responsibility to present the budget here on behalf of the administration, the president's budget. Um, as I said then, and I'll say again, this we had to make tough choices and decisions around the budget priorities, and we uh, elected to hold harmless Title I and IDEA funding and funding for uh, English language learners, knowing that that's going to really reach the, the greatest number of students. And let me so just be very can I clear. Ask you, did let me you just personally say, approve this? Uh, just, I think a yes or no will do the $18 million cut of the funding for Special Olympics? No, I didn't personally get involved in that. Well, I want to tell you, whoever, I, I came up with, uh, whoever came up with that idea at OMB gets a Special Olympic gold medal for insensitivity. To think that we can't spend $18 million to support this dramatically successful venture, which incidentally started in Chicago, Illinois, and now reaches countries all across the world, millions of young people with disabilities. And let me get, let me tell you an area where I think you can save some money for Special Olympics and other worthy causes. Uh, we know that 9% of post-secondary students go to for-profit colleges and universities. Do you know what percentage of the student loan defaults, total student loan defaults in the United States, involves students from for-profit colleges and universities? Senator, let me just comment on Special Olympics. And you know I love Special Olympics myself. I have given por a portion of my salary to Special Olympics. I hope all of this debate encourages lots of private contributions to Special Olympics. So uh, let's not use disabled children in a twisted way for your political narrative um, it's it, that is just disgusting and it's shameful. Well, and Madam I think Secretary, we let me tell you what: that. eliminating eighteen million dollars out of an eighty billion, seventy or eighty billion dollar budget, I think, is shameful too. I'm not twisting it. I asked you to answer yes or no, and you said that you did not personally it's approve. It's not a this. yes or no answer. Well, it certainly is, as far as I'm concerned. Someone has to accept responsibility for a bad decision. Back to the for-profit schools. Do you know what percentage of the student loan defaults in the United States are students from? for-profit schools? 34 percent. 34 percent. Nine percent of the students coming out of post-secondary schools go to for-profit schools, but 34 percent of all student loan defaults are the students from these schools. They're being asked to pay too much for worthless training and education. They drop out heavily in debt with nothing to show for it or end up completing the course and, again, can't find a job to pay off their loans. So let me ask you, again, as Senator Murray has, don't you have a heart when it comes to 140,000 of these victim students who are trying through the border defense uh, rule to get relief from the fraud that was perpetrated on them by these schools? Why is it taking so long for your department to give these students a break? Senator, no student should be defrauded. And if fraud is involved, there are consequences and there will be consequences. But we should not be judging institutions by their tax status. And let's be very honest here. I beg your there pardon. are bad actors what does that mean? on both sides of the equation. But 34% of the student loan defaults come from this one branch of tax status for profit colleges and universities. And we should not be judging by tax status, but by uh, results, results for students. What are the results if 34% are defaulting? Let's talk about the ones that are doing a great job for students, such as Monroe College in New York. 6,000 students. 6,000 students at and Monroe. And let's also I read talk the about the nonprofits that are doing a bad job. They should be held accountable as well. That are, are, but are I will tell you subject something. to bribes. Monroe has 6,000 students. are lying in order to in order to improve their U.S. News and World Monroe Report College statistics. has 6,000 students. There are 140,000 victim students waiting for your department to give them relief so they can get on with their lives. You've got a court order now saying don't delay it. And Senator Murray has said, why are you waiting? Why don't you help these students? They need some help right now from this borrower defense rule. Let me ask you one last question. Do you know the teacher shortage across this country and the damage it's causing in school districts? 
I know that teachers need to be honored and respected and elevated. Are you and that's aware why of the our shortage? Proposal, and that's why our proposal does just that, gives them opportunities I to hope you're aware their of the career shortage. and gives them opportunities to develop themselves. I will just tell you that there is a shortage. I've seen it in my own state this last week in Decatur, Illinois, and Zion, Illinois. And I asked the principals, what's the problem? They said, we can't pay them enough money to keep them, and they're burdened with student debt. Your unwillingness in your department to deal with the public service loan forgiveness program is destroying an incentive. And now you want to eliminate the program. That is a program, an incentive for those to go on and become teachers with the prospect that after 10 years, their student loans will be forgiven. You won't uh, help these students. You haven't approved any of their applications, and now you want to eliminate that program. How did that help us? Sir, every single student that has qualified for that program is being how many would that according, be? Accordingly. Remember, How it's a 10-year program. The students that have applied haven't yet qualified. How about we those are, who have we applied? Are, we How are many very approved? much at honoring the both the spirit and the uh, requirements of that program. And now and you want continue. to eliminate the program. Thank you, Senator Durbin. Senator uh, Langford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for the work. You put in a lot of work in a lot of areas uh, and have identified some areas uh, of high need and are paying attention to some things. Let me let me ask you uh, what the chairman had mentioned before on the Education Freedom Scholarships and Opportunity Act. I know that doesn't come through this committee, but it certainly affects education. It is something that my state is currently dealing with right now in ongoing debate. Uh, we've had a program for a while where um, uh, individuals are able to be able to give money to, towards public schools and their foundations or towards a private or charter or what it may be and have a tax credit based on this. Describe this to me and how this would work. Thanks for the question, Senator. I'll be happy to. Um, the pro proposal for Education Freedom Scholarships is to establish a federal tax credit that individuals and corporations could voluntarily contribute to a $5 billion annual program or annual fund that states could then elect to participate in or not. The states that did, the proposal is for it to be distributed according to Title IIA, so based on both population and poverty levels. And then states would have great latitude in using those funds to develop more choices and more opportunities for the student, the K-12 students in their state. It would allow for um, a state to use something like, uh, or to advance something like an apprenticeship program and opportunity, to increase dual enrollment opportunities, to uh, expand career and technical opportunities, in addition to the more traditional ways that we think about choices and adding choices. And so it really is a wide open uh, and, and very uh, great opportunity, we think, for states to be able to meet the needs of students without taking anything away from the public school classrooms or public school students that are being served today. Now, these are individuals uh, that committing their own dollars to be able to sink that's into it correct. and be able to invest into it. The, again, this is something that's been a successful program in my state, that there's currently debate in my state legislature about doubling a program like that uh, within my own state. Uh, the career and technical education uh, in Oklahoma is ranked number one in the country uh, for what they're doing in career tech and the uh, innovation that they continue to do. It's a longstanding program, uh, but we could always certainly use the help. And uh, though we're number one in the country on it, uh, we'd like to be able to stay that way and continue to be able to advance uh, those types of programs. So uh, I appreciate your engagement on that. I look forward to getting a chance to work on that. I serve on the finance committee as well and look forward to the ongoing dialogue about that in the days ahead. Um, th there is a, uh, an ongoing question about accreditation. Uh, if there is an issue with accreditation and accreditors, and as Senator Durbin brought up before on some questions on accreditation, there seems to only be a heavy hand of basically the nuclear option of taking them out entirely. That doesn't just affect one institution, it affects every institution that they've been around. A as you examine the acc accreditation process, are there specific areas you're trying to evaluate on how to be able to work with the accreditors that are there? Thanks for that question. Um, as you probably know, we're in the middle of a negotiated rulemaking session around accreditation and uh, around innovation in higher education. And uh, there's been some very good dialogue, very good debate, very good discussions. I'm very hopeful that the negotiators are going to come to consensus and that uh, very soon we're going to be able to put forward some recommended changes to make accreditation uh, more uh, relevant to the 21st century and more relevant 
relevant to higher ed institutions today. I'm, I'm very optimistic about Good. that. Well, we, we look forward to that, and hopefully that negotiated uh, agreement comes comes to pass on it. Uh, we could use some, some clarity in that. Uh, one quick comment, then another question as well. Uh, your department stepped up in the area of uh, religious liberty and contracting and followed through a Supreme Court decision. Uh, you took the several months that it took to be able to evaluate that decision to be able to put it in place and to say that the department's not going to discriminate on any faith of any background or any entity based on contracting simply because they have any faith. Uh, thank you for engaging in that. Uh, that's been an ongoing conversation for, for quite a while, and that just because an institution is Jewish or Muslim or Christian or Sikh or whatever it may be, doesn't mean they also can't contribute services uh, to our schools and to the Department of Education. So I appreciate uh, your engagement in that area and for completing that. Uh, one of the areas of loans that I've been very concerned about uh, that I'm, I'm concerned about for families long term is the Parent PLUS loan program. Uh, schools have very little visibility in that. They, they see where the student loans are, but they can't see on the Parent PLUS loans. Many parents want their kids to be able to get into great schools and to be able to be sustained and not carry debt. They carry debt. Those Parent PLUS loans will then garnish their Social Security in the days ahead and everything else. It's a ticking time bomb for those parents as they approach retirement in the days ahead if it's not fulfilled. Any conversation on the Parent PLUS loan for you all? Yeah, I, I think this is a very um, real issue and one that I hope that Congress deals with in a meaningful way. Um, we, we know that 70% of the uh, increase in student loan debt total comes from uh, additional loans to student current students. So it's only 30% that are coming in as new students. And uh, the fact that we're at $1.5 trillion of student loan debt and growing um, is indeed a ticking time bomb. This the, the administration has some proposals around simplifying student loan repayment. But we also are working on an, a more upfront uh, process or information that will provide students with a lot more information going into school programs, they'll be able to compare earnings level, uh, program level data around earnings potential between institutions and among programs. We think that'll be a very important tool and a very important step, but um, I, I think the, uh, the question about unlimited Parent PLUS loans and unlimited graduate school loans is a very, very real one to be dealt with. Okay, thank you. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary DeVos, as I'm sure you're aware, first-generation college students and those who come from lower-income families face unique challenges when they get to college, um, first in trying to get there and then in succeeding when they get there. Two of the programs that have really have good data to show how successful they have been are the TRIO program and Gear Up. Um, so I'm very concerned about your proposal to eliminate funding, all funding for Gear Up next year, and to make significant cuts to the TRIO program, including eliminating the very successful student support services. Yesterday, I had a group of TRIO um, folks in my office, um, students who had gone through the program. And one young woman I met yesterday, a woman named Ashley Dukas, who was from Rochester, New Hampshire, credits TRIO's Educational Talent Search Program as the reason that she was able to go to college. She's the first generation in her family to graduate. Um, she said, I never even thought college was an option until I um, was engaged with the TRIO program. She went to the University of New Hampshire. She's graduated. She said that student support services helped her to succeed there. Um, she has begun to participate in TRIO's McNair program. It allowed her to go to graduate school to study psychology. She is now out beginning her career as a psychologist and is counseling 9-11 first responders. And she says without TRIO, she never would have been able to achieve any of this success. So do you believe, you know, I, I'd, I'd like for you to explain, if you would, the proposal to um, cut so much of TRIO's funding. And I would also ask if you believe that at the federal level we should provide any help to low-income or first-generation students to help them succeed in higher ed. Mm -hmm. Senator, thanks for that question, and uh, let me just begin by saying uh, I believe that we do in many ways support uh, first-generation students, and, and I am uh, totally with you on the need to ensure that they have opportunities. If I could just comment to your specific question around Gear Up and TRIO. Um, 
gear up, we, we have proposed that gear up be folded into TRIO, essentially. They're very similar activities, similar programs, and that uh, the program be consolidated into a state formula-funded program rather than the current competitive grant program that we have because we have 90 to 95 percent of those grants that go to the same institutions time after time and in fact are not necessarily targeted at helping the most needy students and so our proposal would suggest that uh, states that are closer to the students they're serving uh, would be able to better target those resources and would save administrative costs in in the process and and that's uh that's the you know that's what we've put forward as the proposal but you're cutting both of those programs significantly as part of doing that well are you as, not? I, as i said earlier we had to make decisions as part of this budget we were constrained in the total budget we were uh, insistent on holding um, some of the most broad and largest programs harmless and, and steady I, at, I so that we could that you serve said the, that. New, the most mm -hmm. students and I, I, I think, however, um, those kinds of cuts ultimately undermine what the department is trying to achieve by helping those students, particularly those who come from lower income um, families, those students who are first generation in their families to go to college, um, who have more difficulty succeeding. I, I want to go on to student loan debt because in New Hampshire we have the second highest student loan debt burden in the country. and. Our office heard from a woman named Valerie, who's a teacher in Lee, New Hampshire, and she said, I've been repaying my student loans since 2002, and what I've learned is that debt begets debt. This debt has caused me to acquire higher interest rates for loans and credit cards, and the first five years of my career, I struggled to support myself. She goes on to say that um, because of all of the challenges of that student loan debt and her current um, the current salaries for teachers that she's not been able to improve her financial scenario. And you and Senator Langford, um, your exchange about the amount of student loan debt that is currently out there is devastating. We're hearing from people in the real estate community, um, people across New Hampshire, that the amount of student loan debt is affecting young people's ability to marry, um, when they want to, to get the job they want to, to have kids when they want to, to buy a home when they want to. And so given all of that, I don't understand how the elimination of key college affordability programs is going to help us address the student loan debt burden. Mm -hmm. uh, good questions and uh, a concern that we share. We, we want students that most need to be able to access higher ed to do so. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really enthused about some of the efforts we have underway through federal student aid to bring the whole framework and experience around federal student aid into the 21st century and to give students many more tools in be able, being able to uh, research and consider their, uh, their path, their opportunities to be able to know what they're going to, what they're likely to be able to earn through a specific program at a specific institution, to make comparisons, to give them a lot more tools to be financially literate about the debt that they're taking on and what those implications are for the longer term. And one of that, that's one way that we can begin to help uh, help them become better consumers and um, and then in the process to have a, an experience with. FAFSA with, with federal student aid that is much more uh, consumer friendly and much more uh, world class in its uh, in its orientation. Well, thank you. I think what my constituents need is help with that debt burden, not more options. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> thank you, Senator Sheen. Senator Rubio. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Madam Secretary, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing to the chairman and the ranking member. The, I'm glad to see student loans have become such a prominent topic of conversation. I uh, t often talked about the student loan burden that I myself faced after going to school and law school. And so, and, and I know what the significant burden it placed on us for many years. I know people are impacted by it. The numbers speak for themselves. And so I'm, uh, here shortly, uh, we're going to be introducing legislation that tries to tackle this uh, in a different way. It, it, it would eliminate interest in the, uh, in the direct federal loan, and it would replace it with a one-time fee that would not increase, uh, not accrue interest, that would be paid over the life of the loan. It would basically establish a one-time fee that, that 
would account for the cost of servicing the loan and so forth, but at least the student is not pay facing the compounding effect. Another thing the, this bill that we're going to file will do is it's going to automatically place borrowers in a repay repayment plan that reflects their income. So we can guarantee that they're not into default because once, as we all know, these are loans that can never be discharged, not even in bankruptcy in, in many cases. And once you get into default, you're locked out of home ownership and the, the, it has a, a, a sort of a scale effect on, on the rest of your life. Uh, I know this is a sort of a new idea. I think we've shared it with your staff a little bit. We haven't filed it yet, but what is your sense of, of what the department's position would be on that or, or at least their willingness to work with us on it? Well, I think we share a lot of uh, your concerns and a lot of your goals, and I look forward to more closely reviewing your proposal and working with you on that. Uh, we uh, you know, Student loan debt is a crushing burden on way too many in this country, and it's, it's soon to be a crushing burden on our country as a whole. Yeah, again, I mean, I think what we're trying to really focus on is the impact that the accrued interest has yeah. and also the disconnect that exists between how much someone is paying or borrowing, which leads to the another bill that we have, the, which I think is consistent with what the department has recently announced as a priority, and that is providing students information before they seek a particular path and the right to know before you go, which, which would provide them with baseline information. This is how much people make when they graduate from here with that degree. We're not banning any degrees. We're not prohibiting people from even borrowing to pay for those degrees. But we do think there's a massive disconnect between how much people are borrowing and assuming as a liability and a real understanding of what they can expect to earn at the back end of that process. And so the, the combination of those two things, you know, sort of dealing with the compounding effect of interests and more information on the front end, right. we, we think could help from this point forward uh, allow students and families to make more informed decisions. Uh, and, and that second provision about more information is that that's consistent with some of what the department is directing, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And r related to student loans on a separate topic, and, and um, you know, I've gotten a number of emails and inquiries about um, uh, the, uh, the way that the contracts uh, are being handled and the servicing of, of the existing loans. Um, and again, the, what the emails I've gotten from a couple of folks, and, and I'm just curious to see what's going on here with this, is that it really deals with some report language that was included in last year's bill. Uh, about not awarding new contracts to the Next Generation program. And, and apparently, at least according to those who are contacting us, they're saying that the intent of that language uh, has not been followed by, by the department. And I guess now it's entangled in lawsuits and so forth. Could you give some insight or explanation as to the status of all? Sure. What's happening there with all of that? Sure. So the, um, the move to the Next Gen framework uh, requires uh, a lot of new uh, contracting because providers are going to be doing different pieces of the behind the scenes um, loan servicing support for the whole federal student pro aid program. Um, heretofore, the, it's been a real patchwork and it's been sort of layered upon um, year after year after year. So in the process of moving to that new framework, um, change, some change is going to have to take place for some of those who have provided services before. And um, all of the various contractors have every opportunity to bid for work under the new framework. And we're in the middle of that process now. And predictably, there are challenges to and lawsuits uh, about uh, the change, the changes that are being made, um, because we know change is hard. The, has the department been meeting or talking to some of these incumbent providers or, or others yes. that have been in the past? Yes, in regular contact and uh, regular dialogue and making sure that they're, they're aware of and clear on their opportunities for, um, for bidding on pieces of the business. And so, yes, we're, we're being very diligent along the way and ensuring all of those, uh, those processes are followed. Thank you, Senator Rubio. Uh, Senator Reid. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, let me begin with an issue of totally disabled veterans uh, who are, have student loans. I'm pleased the department now has a data matching program for e easing the process uh, for student loan discharge for veterans who are totally and permanently disabled. Uh, we've been urging you, along with several of my colleagues, to have an automatic discharge for these individuals. One uh, holdup was prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of uh, recent act uh, that there was some income tax liability. That's been eliminated. 
So does the department plan to automatically discharge these loans? And if not, why so? Why not? Uh, Senator, I, I believe that is the case, but I will be happy to okay. clarify that for you and uh, check with the folks that are responsible for that to assure that. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Uh, another issue that came up uh, late last year through a Freedom of Information Act request, a, a CFPB report uh, was uh, made public, which did an analysis of those college campuses that had a financial relationship with the bank and the benefits or, or costs associated with that to the students. And they found out that these relationships usually result in students paying much higher fees than, than otherwise. And the most egregious example was Wells Fargo, uh, students at campuses with that arrangement with Wells Fargo uh, paid an average nearly $47 in fees compared to less than $12 at other campuses without these exclusive type deals. So what steps are you taking to carry out your mandate, which is to ensure that uh, the schools act in the best financial interest of their students? Um, sir, we take that responsibility seriously and are working, continuing to work with the servicers through this period and into the next generation framework, which will be a different construct for servicing the student loans. And uh, uh, the, are These are really not student loans. I mean, these are the, the relationships where the uh, school has a, a, a contract with a bank mm -hmm. at providing debit cards yeah. to students, providing other services, in fact, insisting sometimes the student must use this debit card. And it turns out that the fees are quite a bit more uh, steep. Sorry, than, I misunderstood. Than, sure. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and actually, as part of the Next Gen initiative, we have launched a pilot program that will include a debit card for students, uh, very clearly delineating the um, fact that fees cannot be added to by by the banks that are providing the services and um, ensuring that protection for students. So we're very keen about this issue and um, are aware that uh, we need to be ins ensuring that students are not taken advantage of in that way. Will you con uh, continue to ask the FPB to monitor this issue? Because uh, well, we're, we're monitoring it directly with federal student aid. Okay. Uh, let me uh, turn to another issue. There's been a lot of discussion of emergency, but one emergency, I believe at least, is the crumbling schools throughout the country, elementary and secondary schools. And I'm very pleased that Senator Tim Scott, my colleague uh, from uh, uh, Chairman, excuse me, Chairman Bobby Scott, uh, my colleague from the uh, House of Representatives, uh, has joined me in a Rebuild American Schools Act. Uh, to invest, we hope, $100 billion in school infrastructure. I don't think there's anyone in this committee that hasn't visited a uh, school in their state that needs significant repairs and also updating because of the technology that is available now to teach young people and also the, the savings that can be accomplished through better uh, heating systems and better cooling systems. So. Um, I would hope you would support this effort. I think it's important, and I just get your reaction to helping out in, in this school infrastructure issue. Well, I think it's an interesting proposal, a, a very costly one at that. And um, I, I think uh, what I would what I would ad actually advocate for is giving more students and more parents more freedom and choices to find the right fit for their child's education. I think we're going to have we're going to make more progress and have more gains in student achievement if students are able to find schools and education environments that work specifically for them. Well, that's an interesting concept, but we still have the, an obligation to provide public schools in uh, every community, and many of those schools just are absolutely unsatisfied. In fact, sometimes pose a danger to the health of the student. And, and the reality, too, is that uh, choice is not infinite for some families. They have very limited because of transportation, because of many factors. But our fundamental commitment to public schools, which I hope we honor, what I hope encourage us to invest in their reconstruction. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Reed. Senator Hyde-Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Madam Secretary, thank you so much for the phone call last week. I have found you to be so responsive, and uh, you are just making me really proud of the job that you're doing. 
And as we discussed in that phone call, and I have gotten some more information, you know, I just believe it is imperative that the department support research grants to address specific challenges, especially those of uh, rural schools and rural school districts such as we have in Mississippi. And I understand that the department has a grant program, Education, Innovation, and Research, dedicated to funding ideas that will fill educational needs and to improve student achievement. But uh, how are you working to ensure that these grants address the challenges that are most pressing in rural communities, such as literacy achievement and teacher recruitment, which we're really having a tough time with in, I think, the entire Southeast? Thanks, Senator, for that, uh, for your encouragement and also for the question um, about rural, the challenges that rural schools face. Um, we have a number of initiatives that I think really get after the challenges that uh, rural students and rural uh, educators are facing. And one of them is one that will really help advance teachers in their in their uh, own development and in their professional life and uh, their career paths. Um, it's through the EIR program and um, it would allow for teachers to be able to continue to develop um, with their a, a stipend or a voucher that would allow them to uh, do professional development in ways that are going to work for them to control that rather than having uh, the district or the state mandate, whatever it is. And then uh, second delay, to create a program around mentorship of new teachers or ones that uh, ones that really need to have uh, a, a little extra help um, earlier in their career. And that would allow really seasoned, excellent teachers a career path to pursue um, aside from having to feeling like they have to go out of the classroom into an administrative role. And um, that coupled with uh, a focus on um, enabling rural schools and rural communities to have more flexibility um, with the students they're serving and how they do things. I, I think about a school that I visited in Mississippi um, that uh, did not have a physics, uh, AP physics teacher. Um, they partnered with a private organization to provide um, distance learning for their AP physics students, and it was a win-win for everyone involved. Um, being able to work flexibly and creatively in that way, I think, are, are some of the ways in which we can help rural communities meet the needs of their students. Wonderful. And uh, just to follow up to that, uh, how are you ensuring geographic and institutionally diversity for these grant programs and other education grant programs are being implemented? Uh, well, there's, you know, we work uh, with, with you on a framework for each of these programs and then uh, carry out the grant programs in, in accordance with that. And so uh, the, I, we know that there is a need in rural communities, and so we will continue to work with you to be focused specifically in that area. Okay, I have a little time left. Um, Congress has continued to show support of the workforce development, which is something very near to me, most recently with the reauthorization of career and technical education legislation. And as if we have talked before, there are many of these well-paying jobs within Mississippi and across the nation, which we are w waiting to be filled by students with special technical skills. Mm -hmm. It is important that we work together to remove any remaining stigmas associated with career and technical jobs. Uh, what can the department and actually Congress as well do to help support and expand access to career and technical education programs in our K-12 through system and the community colleges? Uh, great questions. Um, part of the answer to that is uh, to implement the Education Freedom Scholarships Plan, which would allow states to uh, create programs specifically around these needs or whatever needs they have in their in their state and in their local communities. And part of it is um, related to proposal to uh, a sixty million dollar proposal to create pre apprenticeship programs in high schools that will allow students to uh, explore and pursue some of these great opportunities and tracks. And I, um, you know, I said earlier that I think we need to be 
helping students learn as early as early you know, middle school what some of these alternatives are, waiting till they're in 11th or 12th grade is almost too late. And uh, we know that there are so many good opportunities out there. And at the same time, uh, it's a, a really important time for business and industry to come close to and partner with educators to create the programs um, that are going to meet those needs and that are going to f give students the opportunity to pursue those, t those, uh, those jobs. Um, beyond that, the short-term Pell program or proposal, I think, uh, helps to get, on, get after that as well to allow students to pursue certification and certificate programs that are shorter in nature, um, but that is obviously post-high school. And to your point on that, what can we do to really encourage industry to invest in workforce training, even at a high school level, to, uh, that we could do to attract industry to invest their actual dollars in those programs? Secretary, we need a pretty quick answer on that. Uh, I think it's happening in, in multiple communities. It needs to happen more, but it really happens by region and by community. Thank you, Senator Hyde-Smith. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, uh, Madam Secretary. Thank you for being back here uh, again. Um, I do appreciate the way that this uh, committee and the subcommittee has worked together in the past to reject uh, these uh, uh, very hurtful cuts that have been proposed by the administration. And I agree that we will likely come to a bipartisan consensus on how to at least hold the line on education spending. Um, but I just will say to my committee members that it is a little hard to stomach a lecture from this administration uh, on the danger of deficits uh, in February of this year. Um, we had a $234 billion deficit, which is a record for this country. Never before have we had that big a deficit in any one month. Uh, and uh, that is the result of a tax cut uh, that was passed, 80% uh, of the benefit going to the richest 1% of Americans, which now commands us to cut money from schools. Uh, and that's the choice we're being asked to make. We need to tighten our belts when it comes to funding for kids because we have chosen to give a massive tax cut, uh, mainly to folks in this country who um, don't really need it. Uh, and so I, I just think it's important to lay the foundation for why we're being asked to pass along these big, big cuts uh, to our kids. It's to finance a tax cut that, by and large, uh, when it's fully implemented, will not uh, help those kids in those lower performing or middle class schools. Um, towards um, uh, that end, um, Secretary DeVos, I wanted to ask you about the effect of uh, your proposal to completely eliminate Title IV. Um, and I say that in the context of a conversation that we are having in this country right now about suicides. Um, suicide rates amongst children ages 10 to 17 has increased 70 percent between 2006 and 2016. It's obviously been in the news tragically over the past several weeks. And Title IV provides over a billion dollars uh, for a variety of activities to uh, improve school climates and to address trauma in schools. It funds suicide prevention programs throughout the country. And so um, I, I want to ask you what the rationale could be for cutting the federal funding that helps schools build these suicide prevention programs, they're just not going to be replaced magically by private dollars uh, when we have a national epidemic that we have to uh, get our head and hands wrapped around. Senator, thanks for that question. Um, the proposal, the budget proposal does include uh, Title IV fund elimination because we believe that that particular fund has been very thinly spread um, it hasn't been uh, specifically used for uh, just school safety activities. Our budget does propose uh, collectively, uh, administration-wide, $700 million specifically for issues or for, for uh, programs related to school safety. To And, and the uh, Department of Ed's budget includes $200 million, $100 million of which is uh, designated for mental health and uh, health and health and social emotional well-being of students um, specifically specifically targeted to really um, getting at school climate and um, helping schools to better um, you know to better 
deal with these issues, these heartbreaking issues at the school level? It, it comes nowhere close to making up for the cuts in this bill, and a lot of that money is spread out over a whole bunch of different kinds of programming other than the mental health and suicide prevention funds that are um, used by schools in Title IV. Um, I wanted to turn to one more issue, um, and, and that is the issue of uh, what has become known as the significant disproportionality rule. Um, this, uh, You and I, I thought, had a very good conversation before your hearings uh, about uh, the concern that um, disabled students and uh, students of color are disproportionately labeled special education and also disproportionately subject to overly harsh discipline. Um, the, the, you attempted to push off uh, a rule that would get us more information on how these uh, vulnerable communities of students are being treated, and the courts actually intervened and said that you could not uh, delay that rule, uh, commanding states to give us data on how those communities of color and disabled communities are being treated, uh, requiring you to implement that rule. And so I just was hoping that you could give us um, confirmation that you are indeed um, requiring states to uh, comply with the significant disproportionality rule in accordance with the court order. Well, Senator, thanks for that question. And let me just uh, reiterate that every student should receive the services they need. Um, I I'm concerned about both over and under identification of students in need of special education services. So um, we, we are committed to treating students as individuals and not more broadly as statistics. The department is reviewing the court's decision and uh, discussing our options, and we will certainly move forward from there. But the court's decision is that you cannot delay the rule, that you have to implement it. So what is there to review about it? Well, it's a, a lengthy decision, and we're still in the process of reviewing it. So you, ha so you are not implementing the rule as of today. You're not requiring states to provide that data. We, we are reviewing our options. I think it's worth the committee's attention to this. There's a court order telling the, the, telling the administration that they must implement this rule, and there's no reason for additional review. Uh, it would be w worthwhile following up on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Senator uh, Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary DeVos, uh, once again in your budget, uh, it proposes eliminating the Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grant Program under Title IVa of the Every Student Succeeds Act. This grant, which Congress funded in fiscal year 19 at $1.17 billion, supports programs that provide for a well-rounded education, uh, safe and healthy schools, and the effective use of technology. In your testimony before our House counterparts on Tuesday, you suggested that this program is thinly spread and not shown to be effective. I've heard quite the opposite from school districts across uh, the country, including in my home state of Wisconsin. For example, uh, the school district of Janesville has used its Title IVa funds to provide robust professional development and training for teachers that enhance the way they use technology in the classroom. And in Milton, Wisconsin, they've used their IVa dollars for after-school programs that teach coding, STEM, and eSports, uh, providing students with exposures to key skills, and even helping them compete for scholar, uh, scholarships for college in these very areas. So given what I've heard uh, around uh, the state of Wisconsin, uh, Secretary, I'm surprised by the conclusion that you've drawn about this program, and I'm really curious about how you came to that. Um, was your decision based on data collected by the Department of Education from school districts on how they are using Title IVa funds, and what have the results been? Senator, thanks for that question, and uh, I, I will again reiterate our, our uh, contention that, uh, again, in the context of finding areas to reduce in the budget, this 
particular program was deemed to be very thinly spread and not particularly effective for any specific activity. And was that... And let me just say that allocations of less than $30,000 are going to an estimated two-thirds of local education agencies and of less than 10000 for another one-third. So, you know, pretty, so pretty thinly was spread. that... You said it's deemed to be spread too thin and uh, ineffective. Was that decision based on data, uh, evidence collected by the Department of Education from student districts, uh, from school districts, on how they're using the funds? Or is that just a sort of gut level assessment that uh, a school district can't do anything useful with $30,000? Well, since the program was reoriented in 2017, there's not enough new data to be able to collect to, uh, to do a specific research project. But we know that $30,000 is going to two-thirds of the LEAs and t less than 10000 to another one-third. Um, well, again, uh, this doesn't seem to be an assessment based on evidence on uh, study, um, and I'm getting very powerful uh, uh, information from school districts across the state of Wisconsin that these are vital. Think about the use of $30,000 to train teachers in using and teaching with um, current and modern technology. Mm -hmm. That can go a long way, a long way. You get them all up to... Uh, you know, up to the latest skills. And I worked on that provision of ESSA with uh, Senator Orrin Hatch. Um, and so I, 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 I really want to call into question how you can decide to eliminate funding for uh, the Title IV A program without any sort of thorough review of how the dollars are being spent. Um, and I want to point out at the same time that one of the purposes of Title IV A is to enhance school safety and address student health concerns. So alongside the elimination of the 4A program, your budget proposes a new $100 million school safety state grant that would, according to your testimony, help build state and local capacity to identify and address the wide range of school safety and student health concerns authorized under Title IV-A. Um, this proposal is perplexing to me for so many reasons. First, Congress has already provided dedicated funding for school safety under the Stop School Violence Act at $100 million in fiscal year 19. Second, if the uh, $1.17 billion under Title IV-A program is, in your words, too thinly spread, I fail to see how a much smaller amount could possibly replace it and provide meaningful support to school districts for the broad range of student health and safety needs. Third, Title IV-A intentionally supports a broad range of programs, gives school districts the ability to make targeted decisions based on their own needs. Any school district could choose to direct their Title IV-A funds to focus on student health and safety if that's what makes sense to them. So your proposal would force them to make the choice, uh, uh, that choice. So Secretary DeVos, um, I agree that student safety is of paramount, paramount importance. But why does your budget make that choice for school districts um, and simul simultaneously give them drastically fewer resources to implement it? Well, Senator, like I said earlier, we had to make some difficult decisions with the budget prop, uh, proposal. And uh, in order to meet the target of a 10% reduction in overall spending, and I will just uh, uh, remind uh, everyone of the context of that, $7.1 billion represents less than 1% of education spending nationally. So it is, in, in the scheme of things, a, a pretty minimal um, reduction amount, but we've we've uh, suggested the elimination of Title IV A just because it has been a very thinly spread and not particularly effective program for any specific purpose. Thank you, Senator Baldwin. Senator uh, Merkley. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Thank you for coming to uh, to talk to us. Uh, I'm very concerned 
about the public service loan forgiveness program. Well, we have a teacher in Oregon, Jed Schaefer, uh, who uh, automatically paid, made his payments every month uh, and um, then continued to make those payments even after he completed his 10 years. And eventually the department said, yes, uh, you've paid it all, and they sent refund checks. Great, all's on track except that the servicer then proceeded to completely wreck his credit. So he didn't, didn't, wasn't able to uh, uh, take the money that he now had available because he wasn't making student loans and invest in other things he'd, he'd planned to. And this is just one small story on this massive uh, situation in which 99% of those who apply for this program are being rejected by your department and the loan servicers that, that you employ. It's every report on it shows that it's a confusing quagmire, uh, that uh, the servicers are poorly informed. They work for you. What are you doing about it? Senator, thanks for that question. Uh, the department is providing loan forgiveness to those students who qualify under the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Um, it takes 10 years to qualify, and Congress made it particularly difficult for students to qualify for it. The rules that you set up, the legislation you passed make it difficult. So within that context, we are forgiving as many student loans or yeah, as many student loans under the Public Service Loan Forgiveness so Program Madam Secretary, as are qualified for. Every single study of this says otherwise. It says that tons of people qualify, but the servicers are poorly informed, they are poorly trained, they often give extremely misleading information. And those studies provide recommendations on how to make all this work better, how to make the rules from your department work better, how to make the servicing through the subcontractors. Why don't you champion uh, this uh, effort to make this program work uh, rather than, than blaming the law, which had a lot of flexibility on it, handed down to your department? Well, sir, it actually didn't have a lot of flexibility. Uh, Congress made it a, a, apparently very difficult to qualify. And so we are going to continue to uh, honor those that qualify for the public service loan forgiveness. But so it's uh, really, perhaps, Madam perhaps Secretary, it would be good to look at some of the, the things that are making it difficult. It's an unsatisfactory response because you have responsibility here. Tens of thousands of public servants were told they would qualify. They started to become eligible in August 2017 in large numbers. And you are the point person. So you should be up here saying, hey, uh, here's what I can do. Here's what the servicers can do. But here's what you, Congress, have to do if indeed, uh, in, if indeed you feel that the law needs to be changed. Because this is a massive disservice to those who have served. They were told in very simple terms, 10 years teaching, nursing, policing, 120 payments. The government will forgive what's left as a thank you. Well, they're not getting thank yous. They're getting rejection notices. 99% are getting rejection notices. And I'm very disturbed uh, that uh, your team has put forward a unique legal argument that because the servicers work for the federal government, they cannot be held accountable uh, for their failures. Uh, shouldn't you be holding those servicers accountable? We are, sir. But you're not. Every report shows you're not. Uh, where is your plan? I'd like to see it uh, submitted here on behalf of these students. It appears that what's going on is that you are working in partnership with these for-profit servicers rather than fighting for these public servants who were promised forgiveness. I was very struck by the letter that was written by Seth Frotman when he was resigning from the CFPB. He said, uh, Mr. Mulvaney, Unfortunately, under your leadership, the Bureau has abandoned the very consumers it is tasked by Congress with protecting. Instead, you have used the Bureau to serve the wishes of the most powerful financial companies in America. Are you serving the public servants you are tasked with or to protect and assist, or are you serving the powerful financial companies profiting off of this malfeasance and incompetence. Senator, the department is forgiving all of the loans that qualify under the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. 
and we will continue to do so. And so you say, but every study shows otherwise. I'd love to see you championing these wonderful nurses, these wonderful healthcare workers, the teachers, the police officers who were made promises that your department is responsible for honoring. Please champion them. Thank you, Senator Merkley. Um, let's go to a second round of questions. Um, on last year, Secretary, the Congress voted the Support Act, which was the Opioids Act passed by Congress last October. In that, we authorized a new $50 million grant program to improve trauma support services and mental health care in schools related to addiction of students or others that students deal with. Uh, the budget request didn't include any funding for that. Um, are, are you open to uh, more feedback on this proposal and working with us to see what might be available to put that October uh, Support Act, the portion that was designed to be in effect for students, in effect? Certainly our Senator, and um, I, I'm just going to reference here, we, we did run a couple of new grant competitions in fiscal year 2018, and uh, we are running one this year. In 18, we made 14 new awards, and uh, we expect to make 80 awards this year to local uh, districts for um, programs targeted on opioid prevention in their, in their communities. And what program are you doing that under? School Climate Transformation Grant. And what was the total of those awards? Uh, I don't have that right information right here, but I'd be happy to get back with you on that. All right. Well, the view of the Congress last October was that something in the $50 million category, when you look at all of the opioid money being spent now, uh, could well be spent directing directly with students. So let's talk about that. It's uh, look forward to that. It's a, a new piece of legislation. I know you're working with some real restrictions here, uh, but one of the things we may want to move forward on as we get a better number to work with would be what are we going to do in this school opioid area on school safety? I, I think there was a, about a I think ninety five million dollars in the budget otherwise and. You've added a $100 million state grant program. You said today that was part of a $700 million overall school safety effort in the administration. Is most of the rest of that in Homeland Security, or do you or the your budget chief there? Well, it's actually spread between Homeland Security, uh, DOJ, and HHS. Um, so it's collective between all of them. And, and I actually did get, just get to the number for those grants in 2019. The amount is going to be $40 million. $40 million. Yeah. Okay. I All right. Well, let's look at that and see if, um, if they're doing what we think in the opioid bill, if we're meeting that need, if there's a little headroom there beyond that. Uh, and uh, let's, let's talk about that sure. uh, later. Now, last year, the Congress passed... Um, and was signed, we passed our bill and along with the defense bill and got this done, as I've said in my opening statement, for the first time in 22 years, we got your budget to you, your appropriate amounts of money on time. What difference did that make that you had that money on October 1 rather than when the other 25% of the government got their money or, say, the March 1 uh, date that you probably got your money in your first year you were... Uh, Secretary of Education, what difference did it make to have that money with a full 12 months uh, that you could plan and spend it? Well, it clearly makes uh, operationally things much smoother and better to be able to plan ahead and uh, to plan the flow of work over grant competitions and, uh, and the like over that period of time rather than waiting to know, waiting to find out what's going to happen and, and having to uh, do things in a rushed manner in a shorter period of time. Well, I, I just think, you know, I think you can spend the money more effectively and more wisely yeah, and absolutely. bid more effectively, and, and hopefully we can accomplish that again this year. On this, the loan servicing issue, this issue you and I have had some serious conversations about before, uh, what you see as a patchwork, 
I see as a competitive environment where people are trying to outperform their competitors and in return for superior performance, uh, get more of the work to do uh, in the future. Both in FY19 and FY18, the bill included language requiring the department to ensure certain elements are included in the next generation processing and servicing environment to promote accountability, transparency, and competition in student loan servicing. Uh, will you ensure that the department will fully comply with whatever we put in the law on this topic? Yes, absolutely. We, we have been and will continue to do so. Uh, I totally agree and uh, know that we need to have a competitive environment on loan servicing, and that will continue under the new next generation framework as well. Well, we'll continue to talk about that, but the, the, we are likely to address this specifically in your appropriating bill, and however it's signed into law is the way I'd expect it to be fulfilled, and yes, I understand. anticipate that you would want to do understand. exactly the same thing. Um, Senator Murray. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary DeVos, as you know, I am working with Senator Alexander to reauthorize the Higher Education Act, and we're both very ho hopeful that we can get a bipartisan uh, bill passed out of the Senate this year. Uh, at the same time as we're working on this, your department has been considering major regulatory changes to how students learn in higher education. Some of those proposed changes are extremely troubling to our caucus, and the department should not be sidestepping the will of Congress. Given that we are having bipartisan negotiations on HEA, will you commit that the department will not issue proposed or final regulations during our negotiations? Well, Senator, I, first of all, I, um, I, I'm very enthused and uh, optimistic about the discussions that you and Senator Alexander are having um, and, and hope that uh, you're going to be able to come up with uh, some very significant mm -hmm. legislation around higher education and, and uh, reauthorizing that, that act. Um, as, as you have indicated, we are underway with a number of different rules, and um, the timeline is such that I don't think we're going to have any final rule prior to Memorial Day, but we are going to continue with our timeline. And well, doing so, I, I doing so according I am, to the, yes, uh, the just process. I am disappointed with that response, and I will be talking with Senator Alexander that because it does make it very difficult for us to continue uh, to move forward in what I think is a very um, good way and bipartisan, which is going to have to be if we want to get this passed. So, uh, let me ask you one other question. Um, more than five weeks ago. Chair DeLora and I wrote you about the department's lack of responsiveness to a directive that was included in last year's Senate committee report that directed, and I'm going to quote it, the secretary to respond to enforcement disclosure requests within 10 days of receipt, end quote, and to publicly ex explain its policy about disclosures. The attorney general from my home state of Washington and 19 other attorney generals have written to you expressing concern about the department its recent actions in this area, and I'm really disappointed that we do not have a response to this letter, and I want to know why you are preventing the sharing of information that is required by your own department's regulations that would help these states to execute their laws, protecting student loan borrowers from abusive and deceptive practices of student loan companies. Senator, our goal has been and it continues to be to provide responses in a timely manner. Um, I would just like to cite the fact that since my confirmation in 2017, I've received, my office has received 124 letters from you, specifically to my office. 110 of those have been responded to. Well, I'm and, talking about and the, responses that doesn't, say something, but... That doesn't include the numerous requests that come directly from your staff to other members of my staff. And uh, since being confirmed, my office has received more than 1,050 congressional inquiries, 979 of which have been responded to. So we are trying to be responsive in a timely manner. Um, often... Okay, I'm specifically referring to the enforcement disclosure request that you are required to respond within 10 days of receipt. Um, that you've not, and I, I uh, it's, th this is required of you, it's required of your agencies, and these attorney generals need you to share that information about law enforcement 
for, for law enforcement purposes. Um, and it just appears like you're trying to hide something without responding. You are required to do so within 10 days. And I said our goal has been and continues to be to be responsive and timely, and we'll continue to do that. Well, it has not been so far, and we are expecting that and want to know from you when you're going to respond to, to those states, as you're required to do. Thank you. Okay. What's your uh, the, the confirmed positions in the office? Are you fully staffed up at the confirmed position level now, the, the No, still, still waiting for two assistants for OPE and um, uh, rehabilitative services. Well, hopefully we can get that done in the near future. I, I actually share Senator Murray's concern on this, and it's not uniquely you, but there are two or three departments that we're just not getting the responses back from as quickly as we think we should. So uh, anything that we can do to help work with you to know how to direct that better to specific members of the staff or uh, whatever. I, it's it's very helpful to us to get the information back quickly. It's sort of the daily oversight responsibility, uh, and it eliminates a uh, an area of friction that we should all want to eliminate if we can. And, and uh, the response number is not what it should be. I think early on, not being staffed up made a big difference. We should be at the end of where, where of that, and you didn't use that as a reason today, but it may be part of the reason over the last several months. But we, we need to get you your team in place, but your team really needs to be uh, as quickly responsive as you can be. Uh, we're, we're your funding source. We have an oversight responsibility in, a different, in addition to that. Uh, and um, I, I would hope that staff from top to bottom would have a, a sense that that reporting is not just a nuisance, but absolutely essential, and I would hope we can continue to work on that and get that to where by this time next year there are no complaints about from either side about either too much information being requested over and over again or not to being responsive to those requests. Senator, do you have further, I, any further comments? I, I just want to make a couple of comments. Obviously, I'm disappointed with the budget that's come before us. You've heard numerous statements on on our side and, and on the other side, and I'm confident that Senator Blunt and I will work together to make sure we are funding our education system adequately. Um, and I do know we need to put a budget cap in, adjustment in place, but uh, I am disappointed in this in this budget, and uh, uh, I, I we want to work to make sure that our schools and our students across the country are getting the support they need in this critically important time, and I just do not agree with the direction of, the, of your budget. But I did want to say, Secretary DeVos, that earlier this year, the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policy Making Act of 2018, its legislation that I worked with Speaker Ryan on, became law. It's a very important law. It will make sure the Department of Education <clears throat> and other federal agencies are making decisions based on evidence, based on evidence, not rhetoric, not partisanship. And I expect your department, as well as others, but your department to quickly and effectively implement that law. And I will be submitting questions for the record on, on the department's plans on that. So I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. Thank you, S uh, Secretary DeVos. The record will stay open for one week for additional uh, questions, and the subcommittee will stand in recess. Thank you.
we probably should start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to say this is a souvenir for